So welcome to our company law class. We would like to discuss corporate activity and uh, legal uh, liability of the company. Uh, but just before that, uh, last uh, time we met, we discussed the company's consumption and various aspects of it, including its contents, uh, how it may be altered or amended. And then we also discuss the legal effect of the constitution. And finally, we discuss supplementation of the constitution as things like shareholders uh, agreement. Now this morning, we want to discuss uh, corporate activity and legal liability. So how do we establish the acts of the company? The company is a juridical person, artificial legal person. It can enter into transactions. But how do we determine that this was done by the company for that matter? The company can be held liable. Or how do we say that, no, this was not done by the company, so we cannot um, hold the company liable. Those are the matters you want to explore. In that respect, we are interested in uh, post-incorporation contracts. Contracts or transactions which are made by promoters in anticipation of the company which is being formed. We also be looking at the indoor management rule or what is otherwise, otherwise known as the rule in the tech one case. We also look at that. We discussed uh, last week the company's constitution, the operational governance document of the constitution, and other matters, such as very special resolutions which have been passed, which are required to be registered with the Registrar of Companies, are people dealing with the company required to know the content, required to be abreast with them, so that when they enter into transaction, they will later not be heard to say that, but I didn't know that the company could not do this or the company should have done that. We also look at whether the company can commit tort. And the company commit crime. So these are the matters you want to be exploring. So the concept of corporate attribution, uh, we have noted that once a company is incorporated, it becomes a body corporate or an artificial uh, legal person uh, capable of transacting or performing functions of an incorporated company. You've noted this already. We've encountered the case of uh, uh, Solomon and Solomon. We've also looked at the case of Moko and Kuma, the case of press against petrodea resources. That because the company is an artificial entity, the company is not a natural person, which has got hands, which has got legs, and all other uh, things about human beings that we know. The company must necessarily function through human beings. And in Moako and Kuma, we recall the teaching 
of Sophia Kufu GSC. Uh, that actually then was that since the company is an artificial person, the only means by which it may act or undertake a transaction is for its directors or some other authorized person to act on his behalf. So uh, if you also look at the case of the Aussie Air Limited against, uh, Aussie Air Limited and DACO against Wood, uh, Professor Modubokran in his uh, dissenting judgment would uh, echo the same uh, point. Now, let me say that once cases are mentioned in a lecture or in a notes or in the chapter that you'll be directed to go and read, it is a requirement that you read the case and then you brief it. So you take note of that. Now, under our law, I um, mean the Companies Act 2019, Act 992, if you look at Section 1441, it provides the legal architecture within which a company can act and within which certain acts will be held as the acts of the company. So let's uh, read Section 1441. Section 1441. Somebody should read for us. Section 1441. Division of powers between general meeting and board of directors. Clause 1. Say a company shall act through the members of the company in general meeting or the board of directors or through officers or agents appointed by or under authority derived from the members in general meeting or the board of directors. Okay, good. So uh, right at the outset, we are being told that when it comes to who has the power to do what or who can or how can the company uh function because the company doesn't have leg, doesn't have hands. We know how the company acts. First, the company acts through all the members when they meet in general meeting, the highest decision-making body, or through its senior management, that's the board of directors, or through agents appointed by either the board or the members in general meeting or officers, including even the individual directors and also employees. So these are the people through whom the company actually acts. So let's uh, take note of that. But of course, um, we have you no know, receiver or liquidator who may be uh, appointed. And when they are so appointed, uh, they have like a special uh, role at that time, because at that time, the directors, for example, uh, may not be uh, function normal because the company is not in the normal times. Like for example, a liquidator where the company is being uh, liquidated, is being closed down. The directors definitely will step aside. An official is appointed. So he will now be doing most of the things that directors will have done. So the company will be acting through the liquidator, statutorily speaking. Uh, in the same way, uh, where a receiver is appointed, uh, later on, when we are learning about uh, the benches, we talk about the benches secured, secured by, let's say, floating child or fish child. And sometimes, uh, when depending upon the developments under the terms of the issue of the debenture, the debenture holder may, for example, 
get the, a receiver appointed to step in and take over the running of the affairs of the company or an aspect of it, uh, especially that particular aspect over which he or she has a charge, that is security interest. So in that respect, the company will also be, in a way, acting through that person. So that's the point we are trying to make here. Mm. So the company, as we have noted, may act through members at the general meeting. And if we look at section 144, uh, sub uh, section two, that the respective powers, the members in the general meeting are determined by the company's constitution. So what the members can do in the general meeting, and mind you, we said the general meeting is the highest decision-making body, uh, what things which are reserved for members in general meeting and cannot be dealt with by, let's say, board of directors or any other person, these are matters which will be uh, delineated or spelled out in the constitution of the company. So let us uh, keep that uh, in mind. And the members, apart from the general meeting, may unanimously agree to a decision. And they may do so by a formal means of a written resolution. And you know what is it we call the unanimity uh, principle. Uh, so instead of uh, having uh, a meeting in the regular way, if a decision needed to be taken, the decision could be uh, set uh, out in writing and circulated to all members who are eligible to have attended the meeting to indicate their vote, whether they endorse it or they disagree. When the last person has signed or, or indicated his or her endorsement, then the decision will be taken to have been uh, arrived at. Now, looking at it, that will be more realistic when we are dealing with the private company. As you know, private company, the membership is controlled, it's limited. But if you are dealing with public company, or you can have over 100 or 200 or thousands of members. It may not be realistic to actually uh, have uh, this uh, written resolution. However, uh, of course, we are not discussing the law of meetings now. Now that we have technology, uh, this law may probably need to be adapted because uh, technologically, it is possible for uh, people to, uh, you know, you, have, you can have uh, resolution indicated, use either the Google uh, pool or whatever. You give a special password to uh, members who are eligible for them to indicate their voting online, and that will also suffice as uh, the written uh, resolution that we are talking about. But we'll explore that more when we are discussing uh, the law of uh, meetings. So when decisions or resolutions are made by members at the general meeting, they become act of the company itself. So mind you, the company is seen as a person, but the company does not have mouth or leg or hand. It's the members in general meeting who actually took a decision, and the decision is being regarded as the decision of the company. And the meeting, the general meeting we are talking about here may be annual general meeting, AGM, uh, or EGM, extraordinary general meeting. Now, if you look at the sub uh, session three, the business of the company is to be managed by the board of directors who may exercise all such powers of the company as are not by the company's act or the company's constitution required to be exercised by the members in general meeting unless otherwise provided by the company's uh, constitution. So any power or any rule which 
have not been reserved by the Companies Act or the Companies Constitution to be something which must be done by the members in general meeting or by some special arrangement, then automatically the directors are competent to do those matters for and on behalf of the company. Now, the implication of this is that a not by one director in a company cannot bind the company unless it is ratified or consented to by the board of directors or the members. Because if we look at the section 1443, the, the business of the company is we manage by the board of directors. So the emphasis here is the board of directors is not to be managed by what? A director. So let's keep that in mind as a general rule. But that is also not to say that a single director cannot act for the company. A single director can act for the company uh, either with a prior approval of the board of directors or subsequently when proper disclosures have been made taking care of uh, conflict of uh, interest uh, rules, the board of directors have given their uh, ratification or the members in general meeting have given their ratification as the case may be. Now later on, when we are learning about directors, you will notice that the company can, you know, they, are, they can have a managing director and the board of directors who have given him uh, a lot of powers, doing almost everything that the board of directors can do collectively, and that is also uh, legitimate. So that one is there. Now, read, se read session one four four subsection six for us. One four four subsection six. One four four subsection six says an amendment of the constitution of a company shall not invalidate a prior act of the board of directors, which would have been valid if that amendment had not been made. Good. So, if the, and this is very important, the members of the company cannot, you know, behave like the Alice in Wonderland, uh, so uh, to speak. And when directors have acted and they are not happy, then they go amend the constitution and say that uh, these things that we did, you couldn't have done them. And for that matter, they are not binding on us. So that is what um, session 1446 is speaking to. So as far as things which directors have done on behalf of the company are concerned, the constitution cannot be amended retrospectively uh, to invalidate that. So let us uh, keep that in mind. And we have uh, noted that the business of the company was managed by the board of directors. That notwithstanding, members in general meeting can exercise certain powers of the directors in certain situations. What are some of these situations? So if you look at section 144, subsection 5, members subject to section 144 can A, Act in any matter. Act in any matter if the members of the board of directors are disqualified or unable to act by reason of a deadlock on the board of directors or otherwise. So 
the first scenario, we are looking at a situation where under the constitution or even under the act, certain matters are supposed to be done by the board of directors. However, the board of directors are having stalemate. They are having, they are not able to reach agreement. Then the members in general meeting can step step in. They can also institute legal proceedings in the name of the company. If the board of directors refuse or neglect to do so, and if the company will sue, the name of the company will be used as the directors who have to decide. But let's suppose that uh, the company will have to sue even the board of directors or some of them, or maybe some other people that some directors are conflicted. And for that matter, they are dragging their feet. So they are not doing it, then uh, the members can step in and take the initiative. The members can also ratify, that is approve or confirm any action taken by the board of directors. And they can also make, so, so this particular one, let's say that the directors, they don't have like the powers to do what they did, but when full disclosure have been made to the members in general meeting, they can grant their blessing and say that yes, despite the fact that uh, you didn't have our prior authorization, I didn't have the power to do this. You've examined what we did, we're happy with it, and we've adopted it as our own. And they can also make a recommendation to the board of directors regarding action taken to be taken by the board. So the members can actually uh, send to do lists the board of directors, as it were. Now, what the directors can do in terms of their powers are determined by the company's constitution. Now, when the board of directors are acting within the powers, conferred upon them by the Companies Act or the Constitution of the Company. The board is not bound by directions or instructions of the members of the company in general meeting unless the company's constitution otherwise provides. So this is very important. Yes, members in general meeting are the highest decision-making body. However, if board of directors stay within the remit of their powers, they stay within the four corners of their competence and they are so acting, they are supposed to be independent. And later on, when we are learning corporate governance, you will understand the rationale for this. And that is why if something should go wrong as a director, you take a personal what, uh, responsibility. So look at the subsection uh, uh, four. It reinforces the point that we have made. And then look at the cases of uh, Scott and Scott, John Shaw and against uh, Peter Shaw, and then uh, Ennis and Nichols. Now, if permitted by the constitution of the company, the directors of the company may exercise their powers through committees consisting of a member or members of the board or as the board of directors think fit. And from time to time, they may appoint one or more of the members of the board to the office of the managing uh, director. So let us uh, take note of that. So it's permissible for board of directors to have subcommittees and the board of directors may delegate some of the powers to these uh, subcommittees or maybe have like a whole uh, managing director uh, to whom 
the board may delegate their authority. So please uh, look at session one, uh, four, six, uh, on session 146. The binding effects of action of the board of directors and members of the company. Uh, where the organs, that is the board of directors, the managing director and members at general meeting, uh, have acted in the usual course of conducting business of the company. Whatever action they took, whatever decision they made, or whatever action or decision is considered as the act of the company itself. And the company may be civilly, that is in civil law, or criminally liable in respect of that act or decision as if it were a natural person. So the, the caveat here is that the relevant organs, be the board of directors, managing directors, men, uh, members at general meeting, for their acts or decisions to be considered or to be attributed to the company, they must have acted in the usual course of conducting the business of work of the company. And that is uh, very uh, important. And if you read the case of uh, Aussie Air Limited against that, and I want everybody to read that case. Mm -hmm. I want everybody to read the case of uh, Aussie Air uh, Darko against uh, this very interesting case, and we see uh, a strong uh, div uh, no, divided opinion in the Supreme Court. Professor uh, Mohd Bokran and Justice Latiba uh, taking a different size. Very interesting. So I'd like you to read it. Now, the organs of the company, uh, that is the board of directors, managing directors, and members, their delegates or responsible officers do not act on behalf of the company, but rather they act as a company itself because they are considered the directing mind and will of the company. So let's get this straight. When these organs have acted, they are not acting in a sense as for on behalf of the company. Is the company acting through them? The company acting through them. So in both Seaco against the uh, Ghana Coco Com Google Marketing Board, the court, a high court at the time noted that where a managing director acts on behalf of a company, it is considered an act of the company itself. And for that matter, it binds the company. And if the person is only an acting managing director, the binding effect of his act on the company is the same. Because what he did in acting capacity, it was a company acting through him. So see uh, West Africa Express against uh, Crunch, where the Supreme Court held in the 1963 that the general manager acting for the time being as a managing director had the authority to enter into an agreement. Now, where, in fact, a business of the company is being carried on by the company, 
The company shall not escape liability for acts undertaken in connection with that business merely because the business in question was not among the businesses authorized by the constitution of the company. And this is very important. The session 147.2b, uh, uh, which I have just uh, quoted. So if the company did a particular transaction and it is sued, it will not be a defense for the company to say that. But if you look at the constitution of my company, this particular transaction does not fall within the scope of things that I have stated in the constitution this company is set up to do. And for that matter, I cannot be held liable. That argument will fall flat on its face. And that is the effect of section 147, subsection 2b. But of course, there are important uh, exceptions to the rule regarding uh, the binding uh, effects of actions done by agents or officers of the company. A company does not incur civil liability to a person if that person had actual knowledge at the time of the transaction in question that the organs of the company did not have the power in the matter or had acted in an irregular manner. So that one, you knew that the person or the organ which you were dealing with, factually, that is actually known to you, they don't have the power to do what it was doing. Or even if you had the power, you knew that it was doing it in a manner which is quite irregular. That is not how the organ is supposed to do those things. A fact you are cognizant or very much aware of, and yet you kept quiet and participated in that transaction. In that case, Section 147.2a is telling us that the company does not incur liability. You cannot sue the company for such a transaction. Again, look at the case of Aussie Air Limited and Darko against Wood, especially the decision or uh, the opinion of uh, Justice uh, Dr. Datiba is very instructive. Now that is premised on what you call actual knowledge, that you must have actual knowledge that the organ, that organ of the company, they don't have that power. Or if it had the power, it was acting in a very irregular manner. Now actual knowledge, it's obvious knowledge in which a party is determined to know of a specific event or subject matter that has resulted in a breach. So this is uh, really objective. It's not just a, a subjective uh, matter only. Yeah, so uh, please uh, look at the, the same point, look at the case of Howard against the patent uh, ivory uh, manufacturing. So the first one, we talk about the actual knowledge, but here, uh, if that person have a regard to the position with or relation to the company, that person Ought not ought to have known of the absence of the power of the of the irregularity. So here, 
you may not have actual knowledge. However, when we look at your relationship with the company, you are placed in a privileged position that you ought to have known of what the organ could do or what it could not do, or even if it could do it, how it ought to have done it in a proper way. Your privileged position uh, towards the company or in relation to the company made you uh, cognizant or you could have actually known all that. So where that is the case and you entered into the transaction in a manner which is against how it should be done or the fact that the company, the organ did not have the power to do it, then the company as an entity will not incur civil liability. So the difference between the first uh, scenario is that the first one, you had an actual knowledge, obvious one. The second one, by reason of your, uh, your position with or relationship to the company, you know what the company can do and then uh, what uh, it cannot do. Now, what about constructive uh, uh, knowledge? Of course, uh, what we just said, the, the constructive knowledge that we, we talk about, we, the first one, we talk about the actual knowledge. So the, the constructive uh, doctrine, as you know it from other areas uh, of, the, uh, of the law, another way in which constructive knowledge will operate to exonerate the company from liability is where a third party with the knowledge of the irregularity or the apparent absence of authority benefits from a transaction. That third party becomes a constructive trustee to the company of any money or property that comes to him as a result of the transaction. So the well-known case of a road uh, sold uh, products against the British still, Lord Bravo Council, uh, LGRC then was make the point that a third party who has noticed actual or constructive that a transaction, although in Travaris, the company, was entered into in excess or abuse of the powers of the company, cannot enforce that transaction against the company and will be accountable as a constructive trustee for any money or property of the company received by the third party, unquote. And so that is how uh, serious uh, it is, not to allow uh, third parties to also exploit uh, the company. Uh, we've noted that a company may act through designated corporate officers and agents. So who is an officer? If you go to the first schedule, and then we discuss this uh, last week, so I'll not belabor uh, the point. So the first schedule uh, officer is defined uh, over there to include a director, secretary, or employee of that body corporate, and receive a manager. But does not include a receiver or manager appointed by the court or a liquidator appointed under the uh, provisions of insolvency and corporate restructuring at 2020 at 10.15. And in terms of section 1481, an act of the officer or an agent of the company is not the act of the company unless the company acting through its board of directors, managing director, or members at general meeting has expressly or impliedly authorized that officer or agent to so act, or the company has 
represented the officer or agent as having the authority to act. So that is how act of an officer or agent can bind the company. There must have been either express or implied authorization. Or maybe uh, some estoppel is created against the company, a representation is made to uh, others that a particular officer has an authority to act, to bind it. And that uh, representation, that impression is actually relied upon by third parties. In that case, the company will still be liable. Now, so session 148B, uh, uh, what we've just uh, discussed, where there is evidence that the company authorized or presented that an officer or agent of the company has authority to perform a particular function, the company becomes civilly liable to any person who has entered into a transaction in reliance on that authorization or presentation. And in that case, remember you are section 26 of the Evidence Act. That will also come in, isn't it? Uh, estoppel by uh, statement or by conduct. However, the company will not be civilly liable where the third party had actual knowledge that the officer or agent did not have the authority to act, or that having regard to the position with or relationship to the company, the third party ought to have known of the absence of authority. So in the same vein, uh, which we discussed uh, earlier on, uh, that if you have a privileged position in the company, and you know that a certain organ does not have a certain power, or if it has a certain power, it's not acted in that way, the same thing applies to uh, an officer or agent, if by reason of your relationship with the company, you know the particular officer or agent has not been so authorized by the company, or if he has been so authorized, he's not uh, following the particular procedure he was asked to follow. And if you ignore it and go ahead to enter into transaction, then the company will not bear liability. So look at the, the case of a, a Freeman against uh, Beckerhead's Park Properties. A very interesting case, a, a Freeman uh, Lockyer case. And read uh, Lord Diplock's uh, opinion. Lord Diplock gave a very important uh, criteria uh, which should guide uh, when we can uh, make a determination as whether a particular act of an officer that is an agent is binding upon the company or not. So read the case of Freeman against uh, uh, Becky Hess uh, Park Properties Limited. The authority of an officer or agent of the company may be conferred before action is taken by that officer or agent or by subsequent ratification. So it works both ways, just like law of agency. You, uh, yes, we have the agency by express appointment, by ratification. Ratification meaning that at the time that the agent acted, he had not been uh, given authority. But subsequent to that, he made the necessary disclosures to the principal, and the principal who adopt or ratify. So the same idea is applicable to actions of uh, officers of the company. Now, knowledge of the officer or agent's action and acquiescence of the action by any of the organ is equivalent to ratification by members in general meeting, board of directors or by managing director. In other words, where an officer or agent has acted, he did not have authorization to have acted, he has acted, and having acted, uh, the board, having become aware of it, 
they are dealing with this officer regarding that the transaction as if they had previously authorized him or as if they had uh, ratified it. Then uh, section 48 to subsection 48 to 3 and 4 are telling us that, yes, the board of directors, as the case may be, will be considered as having uh, ratified the action of the officer or agent who acted without prior authorization by reason of what? Acquiescence. However, the power of the company or the right of the company to uh, be reimbursed, be reimbursed against the the agent or the officer who had plunged the company into transaction uh, that the company had previously not been uh, had authorized the agent to do, the company can get you no know, reinvestment indemnity uh, from, and of course, in the same vein, the principle of vicarious liability uh, wants to apply uh, because the officer or the agent acted for the company then the officer, including the employee, uh, can let the company be vicariously liable for actions of the employee, as in the usual uh, uh, labor law, that the act of the employee uh, can be enforced against the employer uh, vicariously in the course of his employment. Now, let's look at the corporate actions and legal uh, liability in some specific contexts, especially post-incorporation uh, contracts. Uh, why do you have your next lecture? My Lord, please, around 12 o'clock. OK. All right, so let's do some few minutes before our lazy to get ready and go. Okay, let me see if we can finish. I don't know. Let me see. How long? Um, uh, uh, wait, we cannot, we cannot, we cannot finish. We cannot finish. You cannot finish, so I'll take I'll take questions at this stage and then we'll end. Uh, any questions on what we've discussed so far? <laughs> 